25 years ago, I made a series of films about wine that saw me travel the world, building up into a history, which then became a book. Today, I thought I'd revisit it and cut it up into bite-sized chunks for you to view exclusively online. I hope you enjoyed viewing them <laughs> as much as I enjoyed making them. You could call Madeira really an accidental wine. No normal person would go looking for wine on a remote island in the Atlantic. But ships going to America had to stop there. And when they were there, they at least tried the local wine. They didn't find it much good. It was pretty thin. But once they'd carried it all the way to America, they were quite surprised with what it tasted like. So Madeira began to be exported in the most primitive conditions and given the rough treatment of a long voyage across subtropical oceans. Madeira lies right in the old sailing sea lane from England to the Eastern American ports. This is where politics took a hand. The British had no intention of allowing free trade between their American colonies and Europe without taking a cut. But Madeira was not Europe. King Charles II had decided that it was part of Africa. So it was in Boston, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and down to the West Indies that Madeira became the staple colonial wine. Despite its humble origins, the planters loved it. And word of a strange sea change soon got back to England. The wine they loved didn't just survive the long voyages, it actually reveled in them. The merchants of Madeira and their customers were amazed to find that the longer the trip, the better the wine became. In fact, they went to the lengths of organizing round voyages, voyages to London, that's from Madeira, via the West Indies, or even via the East Indies. Now, India and back means crossing the equator twice, and that's an ordeal by heat and motion that would have turned any normal wine into vinegar. But defying all the normal rules, deep in the hot and smelly bilges of a rolling East Indiaman, Madeira just went on getting better. Madeira today no longer gets its incredible flavor from long sea crossings. It's matured on the island itself under similar torrid conditions to the hold of a long-distance ship. Madeira, it became clear, thrives on heat. Where other more delicate wines need cool cellars to nurture them, barrels of new Madeira are hauled up into lofts to age in sometimes stifling temperatures. What's the paper here? Yes. I got a force. There is a parallel with sherry. Both wines are slightly fortified with spirits to stabilize them. But Madeira's high acidity gives it a unique constitution that revels in exposure to oxygen that would spoil any other wine. Not all Madeira could go on long sea voyages for its health. So in the last century, a substitute was found giant furnaces in the lodges where the wine is made. The boiler heats water that circulates in these iron pipes round a room full of wine, which is not inappropriate, they're called a stove. And the whole room is kept at a temperature of 45 degrees Celsius, which is 115 degrees Fahrenheit. In fact, the whole net effect is that we're in a sauna bath, the wine and I. The fumes aren't delicious, but boy, are they strong. On my filming visit to port country, I find myself in the middle of a winemaking picture which really goes back to the Middle Ages. It was extraordinary to see fine wine being made in such a primitive way, wonderful as it is. <laughs> Every drop of that will end up in a glass in St. James's Club. A little bit long way from here, isn't it? <laughs> it only takes two days for the sweet juice lying in the open lagar, up here just behind this wall, to ferment half its sugar into alcohol. Then the sluice gates are open. And all the juice, dark red, 
very sweet and sticky, but only halfway to being wine, pours down into these vats on the floor below. Part of the point of the long hours of treading is to extract the absolute maximum colour from the grape skins. The juice stains a white bowl, deep mulberry purple. Now, the unique thing about port making is that these vats are already filled up to about here with very strong grape spirit, strong enough to stop the fermentation in its tracks. In fact, the mixture of wine and spirit is far too strong for yeast to function in it at all. The result, port, is both very sweet and very strong. Not everyone agreed with the way port was being made in the 18th century. It was a contentious matter, adding strong grape spirit to it, for example. The idea of adding brandy has been standard practice now for 150 years and more, but it only arose out of bitter arguments about adulteration. The first ports were naturally strong, dark wines. They might have become very good with age without the need for fortification. But then port merchants took to adding more and more buckets of brandy for strength and even elderberries for colour. Port became very potent and not very pure. They were berated for it by one of the most formidable characters in the history of wine, Joseph Forrester, a Yorkshireman who was eventually given the Portuguese title of Baron. He was a cartographer of brilliance who made the first accurate map of the Douro, a scientist and surveyor, but above all, a purist who hated the thought of adulterating good wine with brandy. He campaigned to stop what he believed was malpractice. The port we know today was made over his dead body. And so indeed it turned out. In those days, in fact, until the 1960s, the only way to get wine down the Douro to a porto was to load it onto perilously romantic looking barcos, shaped rather like antique galleys and navigate a series of rapids. I was in one of the last of these boats to shoot the rapids. When you crashed along with 60 pipes of port down a whitewater sluice, your stomach stayed in mid-air. Today, the Douro has been dammed to make a series of lakes, perfect for water skiing, but very different from the river Forrester knew. And the wine goes down by truck. This is where Forrester met his end. This placid pool was then a roaring gorge. About where this track is, his boat capsized in the rapids. Well, his lady companions were all right, but they were buoyed up by their crinolines but Forrester was wearing a belt of gold sovereigns, and he drowned. What you're going to see now about port may look rather like archive footage, but believe me, this is exactly the way it was when we were there. People appreciate it for that. People love the fusty old atmosphere that goes with it, but above all, they love the flavour. Port needs no new barrels. Its container and measure is a huge pipe holding 522 litres which is cleaned again and again, and then rebuilt. Top quality port aged in wood here for up to 20 years or even more is simply called tawny from its faded color. All qualities of port except one are aged in wood for a greater or less time according to their quality. But that one is the very best port of all, known simply as vintage with the maker's name and the year. Vintage port is the wine that instigated the whole notion of maturing any wine for long years in bottle to grow mellow. <laughs> Vintage port is always served in a decanter, and not just for elegance sake. Watch what happens when you decant it. It's been in its bottle since it was raw young stuff, this is 20 years old, a normal age to drink vintage. And when you pour it out, all its cast-off rawness appears as a rather alarming red sludge at the bottom. 